Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for being here on World Oceans Day. We are very excited to be having this conversation with everyone, and we have some wonderful speakers lined up today. I'm not going to take up too much time. I'll do a short little introduction, and I'm going to be passing it off to our event partners who will lead us through the event. I want to start off today with saying that our hearts are heavy here at WEC Indigenous as we remember and honor the 250 215 spirits lost at the Kamloops Residential School. We continue to work in solidarity with all Indigenous communities across Canada. And as June is National Indigenous History Month, we ask that the ecosystem continue to work together to build a more inclusive innovation ecosystem for Indigenous women entrepreneurs. Now, this event is part of the national series of roundtables that WEC held throughout spring of 2020. Some of you may have joined us last year for one of our roundtables that we held in various regions or various areas in the Atlantic re region, sorry. All the conversations that we had with Indigenous women entrepreneurs during these roundtables was used to put together our uh, report, Makwa Makwa Ikwe, a national needs analysis on Indigenous women's entrepreneurship, which will be shared in the chat and also in the follow-up comms with the email. After we had these conversations, re released this report, we want to come back through the regions and have discussions with our different regional partners and the indig Indigenous women and Indigenous communities in those regions about what we can do going forward and what we see happening in our local ecosystems. I'm very excited today to be having this conversation about our connection to water and how water relates to entrepreneurship and our ways of knowing and being. Again, I won't take up too much time. I would like now to pass the mic off to Kelsey Johnston of Creative Destruction Lab Atlantic and Natasha Martin Mitchell of Women in Business New Brunswick. Thank you so much, Kara. Uh, I'm gonna do the Nova Scotia based land acknowledgement for our event today. So we'd like to begin by acknowledging that Dalhousie University and CDL Atlantic are located in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory is covered by the Treaties of Peace and Friendship, which Mi'kmaq and Wolastawig people first signed with the British Crown in 1725. The treaties did not deal with the surrender of land and resources, but in fact recognized Mi'kmaq and Wolastawig title and established rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between nations. We are all treaty people. In Delhi, Natasha Martin Mitchell, Bulay with Lustigwich, Nenege, Wigi, Frederick New Brunswick, Lustigwe, Migumigao. Um, I am Natasha Martin Mitchell. I'm Mi'kmaq from Listigwich First Nation, but I currently reside in Fredericton, New Brunswick, which is located on the unsurrendered and unceded territory of my brothers and sisters of the Listigwe Nation. Um, the lands of the Wabanaki people are recognized in a series of peace and friendship treaties to establish an ongoing relationship of peace, friendship, and mutual respect between equal nations. Thank you, Natasha and Kelsey. Um, before I forget, because I already did, if you didn't see my email prior to this event, Doreen Bernard will be performing a small water ceremony for us to close out our event, which I'm very honored and excited about. So if you have a chance, if you haven't already, if you could grab a glass of water during the event or now, um, because you will be needing it at a later time. And I will invite Kelsey back to introduce Catherine. Thank you so much, Kara. Um, we have Catherine Martin from our Dal Elders in Residence program here to start us off in a good way. Hello, my name is Catherine Martin, and I'm a member of the Mi'kmaq Millbrook community in uh, near Truro. And I'd like to welcome everybody today, especially on the World Ocean Day, which is near and dear to our hearts as Mi'kmaq, as the Onu of this land. 
I um, welcome you to our territory, um, especially the area I am in is the area of my um, ancestors, the hunting and trapping territory in Chibuktuk and uh, all the way down the shore to Truro and over to Parsboro and over to Falmouth. So I'm very um, honored to welcome you to the unceded territory and thanks to our ancestors. They thought ahead seven generations when they um, secured the peace and friendship treaty that never gave up our land, never, we were never a conquered people. We only agreed to continue the way of life that we have had for 14,000 years when the Europeans, the new immigrants, the British and the French arrived. We um, secured a, a, a promise with them that peace and friendship would continue as we, the people, have always lived. And uh, it would also ensure that we, as the ONU of this territory, um, be respected in letting, making sure we uh, continue to live the same way we always lived with gathering, hunting, fishing, and being our connection and contract with Mother Earth be, be respected. Um, I need to acknowledge uh, the recent uh, horrific um, discovery and the affirmation of um, genocide that has been going on since the arrival of the new immigrants, the British and continue in other ways through laws to continue to try to diminish who we are. But our treaty is, is strong and it has kept us alive this long and we will continue till the end of, of time. I um, welcome you again and in peace and friendship, I, I extend my um, greetings to all of you. And I'd like to sing um, a song that I wrote. I usually would sing Guanu Day, which is a welcoming chant, but I want to sing a chant that honors um, the women who have been uh, protecting the oceans, the womb, the water of our Mother Earth's womb, the oceans, the sacred waters. Um, like uh, Doreen Bernard and her uh, and many of the women that she's part of that have been protecting um, recently some of the waters that are are being disrespected. So I'm going to sing this, and it's about it's about the women. Away your head. Away yo hey hey yo Away yo hey yo hey yo hey yo Away yo hey hey yo hey yo hey yo Away yo hey yo hey yo hey yo Away yo hey hey yo when an elder dies, a child is born, and the moon she will rise for the setting sun, and she'll move the ocean tides with the power of her mind away oh hey away oh hi ya hey yo away oh hey ya hey ya hey ya away oh hey hey ya hey ya hey ya away oh hey ya hey ya 
heartbeat of Mother Earth represented by our drum beat. And that same heartbeat is the heartbeat inside of our own mother's womb, just like the ocean sacred waters. Our mother carries us in her sacred waters that connect to our very first grandmothers. So when we speak from the heart, we're speaking from the language that we all heard inside of our mother's womb. And the language that we hear all around the world is the heartbeat of Mother Earth through the drum. So when we're in Mi'kmaq or the land of the Ilnu, we know that when we speak, we are to speak from our hearts because it is the truth, because it is the first language of all people, and it is the language of our mother. Well, Aliok, and um, I'm very glad that we're all together today. And sit Nogama, Aliok. Thank you so much, Catherine. I'd like to go ahead and introduce our first speaker for the day. We have Nicole Travers joining us. Born and raised in Little Port, Alamastuguek Uktahambuk, Bay, Bay of Islands, Newfoundland, Nicole Travers is a Mi'kmaq artist creating a multitude of inspiring pieces. Inspiration drawing from old style beadwork from museums, hieroglyphs, and petroglyphs. Nicole marries historical styles of beadwork with modern day techniques into contemporary form. Most recently, she has begun to tan various animal pelts and skins into leather using traditional teachings and has started to utilize home tanned fish skin in her art, creating sought after unique pieces. Please join me in welcoming our first speaker, Nicole Travers. Thank you, Kelsey, so much. Um, I've got a presentation here. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen. I want to thank you, Catherine. You, you brought tears to my eyes. It was absolutely phenomenal. I could have just sat here and listened to you for the whole event. Okay. Um, so yes, as Kelsey introduced, my name is Nicole Travers. And um, I've been beating, I was beating with something for myself. I'm gonna speak from my heart here. I don't have any words practiced. I just have some slides to, to trigger my conversation. So mm -hmm. um, I started beating around six years ago when my eldest daughter, I was still on maternity leave with her and she was uh, still an infant clung to my side. Um, I had, uh, I was living away in Alberta in a landlocked province and um, beating was always something that I was drawn to even as a little girl and I was really intrigued. So I, I, I didn't have access to any local beaters. Uh, so it was something that I gradually picked up on my own. And um, 
I started learning different tips and tricks and techniques and things. And um, here I am today, six years later, <laughs> tanning fish skins and, and doing hide. Um, so I'm from a little place on the outer Bay of Islands in the Gulf of St. Lawrence called Little Port. And it literally is a little port. Um, my family, I am, I am an old new woman, but I mean, just like many people, I, I am of settler descent as well. Um, my father's family came from the south coast of Newfoundland and worked their way up along the west coast and settled in Littleport. And my father's family have been here for over 200 years. Um, so in the picture on the left, you see the Bloomington Mountains in the background and you see the house that I grew up in the land my father was born on, my grandfather was born on, um, anyway. <laughs> and then the picture on the right, you see again the Bloomington, uh, the Bloomington Mountains, and this is the view from my home. My home is actually in this photo. We are surrounded by marshes and lakes and rivers and ponds. My father is a fisherman. My grandfather is a fisher, was a fisherman. My father was a fisherman, I should say. He's passed now. My, my mother's family as well were um, highly involved with uh, fishing and hunting and trapping. And, and it was something that was part of my everyday life. Um, I just wanted to give a visual representation here as to where I'm actually from. So the, the, uh, the circle here on the right is the Bay of Islands. And then we are right here in Little Port, little tiny place out literally in the Gulf. It blows all the time. <laughs> so here I am. I have two little girls. Victoria is my oldest. She is uh, six and Emily is my youngest. She just turned four. Uh, this picture was taken last summer as we, uh, we, we try to keep the kids around nature and hikes and walking and things and I I lived away for 20 years and when my father was sick and dying I decided I wanted to move home and I wanted to raise, raise my children home on our own lands uh, around my family and around my own people so that they learned our traditions and our our ways of life and that it wasn't foreign to them uh, Cedar Cove is a, is a very common place where we, where it's just, for me, it's, I leave my backyard and I go there and this was a, a really windy day. <laughs> um, these pictures, it shows the cod fishery and my family through the generations. The last picture that was taken, I was about 10 years old in this photo. It's, uh, it starts off with my great grandfather and my grandfather, then my grandfather and my father. And then my father and my sister and myself, and it's all taken in Little Port. And we've been here and we've been, we've been respecting the ways of, of the fishing and the harvesting of the animals. And my father, growing up, my father always said, you know, like, you're not gonna harm the ocean. You're not gonna harm the breeding, breeding grounds if you, you harvest in a sustainable way. And if you, if you fish respecting the environment and you, if you fish only taking what we needed to get us through the winters and to be able to maintain a meager lifestyle, a meager living. The size of this, the fish nowadays, we call them fish. We always called codfish fish. The codfish in my great grandfather's hands and then my father's hands and then the one that's hung on the gaff between my sister and I, they've changed in great they've changed greatly in size since the, the the skins that I started tanning later on are much smaller so last year when I started tanning skins my father passed away in 2018 so I no longer have the ability to jump in a dory whenever I want but because I live with my family my extended family I have cousins here Jim who's uh, who's at the, uh, the outboard engine there. He's, he's got a jigger in his hand. Um, said to me, he said, come on, Nicole, come out. We'll go to the place that Pop always used to take us. 
So me and my daughter, Tori, we're out in Dory here and we're going to get some food for the food fishery. And um, those skins turned into leather. And this is when it last summer is when I started my process. So my meat for my codfish ends up in my freezer and, and uh, we don't have a little, we only have a little bit left, but I expect it gone within the next few weeks, just before the season starts again. It's, um, I look at the photo of my hand here holding the, the codfish skins, and that is actually my father's dory that he would have built. My, my brother-in-law owns it now, and he, he still carries on the tradition of, of taking the orange dory out in, in, in the Gulf. My life has always been surrounded by fish, by the water, and I didn't realize how much of a connection I had with it until I started making the work and others started looking at my work and they told me what I was doing and I didn't realize what I was doing. I was like, you went in my mind, you, can you read my mind? And that's what it felt like. When I moved away to Alberta, and I lived in Alberta, a landlocked province. It took everything in my heart to leave. It, um, I, I'm an avid, I love to swim. I love to be around water. Like my kids are at Bottle Cove Beach right now doing a beach cleanup for World Oceans Day. Every day, every night that I went to sleep, I dreamt of the water. I dreamt I was swimming and snorkeling and just in the water and when I'd wake up and realized I was in a landlocked province, I was a little bit sick to my stomach. So coming home back in 2017 felt like the most natural, natural process for me. Like it was, it was where I was supposed to be. My, um, my brother-in-law thought I was a little bit crazy when I first started uh, talking about wanting to turn fish skins into leather. And um, he was like, yeah, okay. I, he said, I'll save you some skins and you can try it. <laughs> I said, yeah, don't worry. I said, it's, a, it's, a, it's an experiment. Let me try it. He said, okay. I, uh, unfortunately, I didn't take any pictures of me scraping uh, codfish skins. These are of eel skins that were gifted to me by Ivan White at Flat Bay last winter. Um, and I am forever grateful for him. And I, I, keep telling him, I have to give you a gift. I have to give you a gift. It's, it's not lost on me yet, but his gift is coming when, when his time comes, when it's right for me to, to, when I know what I need to make for him, it will be there. The, um, uh, it's funny. I'm, I've actually got a piece of eel skin in my hands now. I, I, when I'm thinking and talking, I've got to have something in my hands. When I take out my skins and I start to work with them, I'm, the rest of the world can be in chaos around me. The kids can be playing. The dog can be scratching at the door, but I don't hear anything. I am in the moment. I am looking at the skin. I am feeling the skin. I can feel, it's almost like I become a part of the animal spirit becomes part of me. I want to ensure that I'm honoring in, in this example, I'm, I'm honoring the eel. The eel I know was used was eaten it was harvested in a sustainable way it was the the skins would have gone back into the water for sure i know that and um and i want to make sure that my work reflects the impact that they, it has on me so the process of tanning the skins is very simple um, it's just a little bit of a lengthy one. Um, the skins are scraped of the meat, just as you would of a hide, and scales, and then it's washed and degreased. And, it, and then it's a process of tea tanning solution that's um, done over a period of between five and seven days, depending on the thickness of the skins. And as the skins changed into a tangible leather that you can use and is preserved, I have fell in love with working with them. The eel skin is probably my favorite to bead. The salmon skin to me looks like, it looks like chocolate. 
the, the way that the scale, um, the pockets where the scales are held. And each piece is, is a, it's a life of its own. For me, it's a life of its own. I can pick up a piece and say, oh, I remember tanning this. And I remember what lot it was. And I remember how I was softening it. And um, it's definitely a process where it's an unconscious, but it's a conscious, it's a, it, I'm in a good mindset when I'm doing it. The, um, the changing, I, I, as I, when I started beading, I loved the double curves and I loved the, the, the flat earrings and the applique beadwork. But I also wanted to honor the double curves and the hieroglyphs and the petroglyphs that are not as commonly seen today. And I wanted to make pieces that were obviously Mi'kmaq, but to anybody looking at them and not knowing these represent what these representations are, maybe they wouldn't see it. To somebody in the middle of a big city who who was not familiar with this, they'd say, "Hey, that's beautiful. What is it? Where did it Where did it come from?" And it's a way to spark a conversation around a topic that is, it's a resurgence of, of that knowledge. And it's a way for me to learn and um, research because a lot of it is research. I'm, I'm here out on the West Coast of Newfoundland. I, I wish I could just pop in a boat, especially with COVID. Um, and talk with so many people that have all this wonderful knowledge. But as the more I learn and the more I, I apply my work into and onto the skins, the more I, I realize I'm doing, I'm doing something right and I'm, I'm honoring old ways and I'm, I'm trying to make sure that I'm doing the work sustainably where I'm not using harsh chemicals. There are processes where I could tan a skin and I could use writ dye and clothing dye, but those would all end back up in the, the um, ecosystem. And um, the more you learn, the more you don't want to be damaging any further than, than what processes could be doing. When my, if somebody were to lose an earring, I want it to be able to just biodegrade and go back to the earth. I don't want it to last forever and ever. Things weren't meant to last forever and ever. Tangible items in earrings and things. Each piece that I've created, when I create them, it's usually a commissioned piece and I I think of the person and if I know the person, it's easier to create. And I started getting into um, designs and it would be my representation of what quill work would look like if it were beaded. Melissa Peter Paul does beautiful quill work. And then Jordan Bennett has a representation where he, he takes a piece of quill work and he makes it ginormous and it's painted and I want I it wasn't it's not meant to be a copy of anything but it what what how would it look if it were beaded my that's my my medium that I like to work with I don't let oh I thought that was a little bit smaller <laughs> um the double curves I like using the petroglyphs and the double curves of course this is a um a piece of salmon skin um, I actually have these in right now. And again, I just, I keep thinking chocolate. It looks like chocolate to me. And um, very, very often I'll be in a meeting or I'll meet somebody new and they'll go, I love your earrings. I can't stop looking at your earrings. I'm like, oh, thanks. Uh, yeah, I made these. These are fish skin. I said, it reminds me of chocolate. <laughs> I don't know if it's the color, the texture, but yeah. But when I, when I start creating designs and doing uh, a piece for somebody, I try to think of them. And every time I lay a stitch, I'm thinking of them. And unconsciously, each, each stitch and each color that I'm choosing, 
I, I don't want to force anything. I try to think I don't want to give uh, examples because it's so personal. And, and I did make a pair for one individual and I view her as a warrior within her community. And that's soon as she asked me to make her a pair of earrings, I said, I have, my mind went, I have to make you shields. I have to make you a representation of shields. This is another example of codfish skin. I have to make you shields. And this is what I came up with. It's a quill work version of a shield for a woman who is delicate, but strong. It's a, it's, a, how do you explain a, a, a creative process where you let your, your intuition and your spirit speak for you through your work? I may work on a piece where I am, I might take three days to draw something up and then all of a sudden when I'm in the middle of it, nope, it's scrapped and I'm doing something different. And then all of a sudden I realize I cannot put this down. I have to get this out. I have to get this out. I have to put it forward. The eel skin is so smooth and such a beautiful representation amongst those colors that it felt like such a perfect fit for this individual. And um, I, always, I, I, I always hope, there's a part of me that goes into it and a part of pride. And I, uh, I really hope that that comes through. And um, I've said in the past, I am only learning on my journey. And my work is always representative of where I am on my journey. Growing up um, as our main source of income and in our household was uh, the commercial fishery as my father was a commercial fisherman. And being a child of the moratorium, the Newfoundland moratorium, I understand how the water has affected my life growing up and not realizing how water has affected my work as an artist until somebody disseminates it and tells me. I understand and I've seen the effects of the changes of our environment on the size of the fish that have changed in the last 30 years from when I was a teenager to now, that we have to be able to spark these conversations and have these conversations as to what we, what we need to start now. We need to start last 10 years ago. And I'm hoping as well that each individual piece that somebody wears, they can say, oh, it's fish skin. Yes, I didn't know you could do that. Yes. Well, guess what? I can't make big pieces anymore because the skins are not as large. It starts a conversation as to, oh, the things are changing. Things are not what they used to be. How can we adapt to that? And I go back again to my... Uh, my little girl, and it's something that we always do. And my girls are now um, over on Bottle Cove Beach cleaning up as part of the school program. But it's something that I've, I've always taught them. Uh, this, the picture of the flower pot had washed ashore. And this is all garbage that was left, left behind on the beach. And um, my daughter is three in this photo and we took a walk and we always fill our pockets with plastics and garbage and it's gotten to the point where we always take a garbage bag and I'm trying to instill in my children that it's ours. We have to take care of it. Even the little pieces, even the little bands that go around the lobster pot, uh, the, lo the claws of the lobster, we have to pick those up. And the picture in the middle is my, uh, my, my MLA, she's two and um, we cannot keep her out of the water and I hope that she, she keeps that connection. And um, she had, if I have anything to do with it, <laughs> she will. 
Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, it's easier to have a conversation if, um, and I'm sure we're going to have that down the road. Walalio, uh, Walalan. Walalan, Nicole. I certainly connected to your story and your passion. Um, so I'm certain that others here on the call uh, did as well. I also have the pleasure of introducing Barbara Sylvester, our next speaker. She's originally from Eskasoni, but now married into the community of member two. She has resided in Truro, Nova Scotia for the past 14 years with her husband, Darren, and their two beautiful daughters, Devin and Taylor. She also has the honor of being grandmother to four-year-old Denver. Uh, yes, thank you, Kelsey. And thank you so much, Nicole, for that wonderful presentation. Your artwork is just so beautiful and inspiring to look at. And I just thoroughly enjoyed our conversation when we originally met and hearing your presentation now. So thank you. Barb um, is actually battling a voice box issue with flare ups without warning. So she will not be able to present today, but I would like to thank her so deeply for being here. And I actually met with Barb last week and we had a phenomenal conversation. I just, it was one of those conversations where you meet someone and you feel like you've known them for years that you actually just met. Um, and yeah, we were talking about the water we grew up with in our communities and the way that our families have been connected to the water. And she shared stories with me about her grandson, Denver, and um, the picture in the background of her screen there. And I believe that's the local stream or river in their community. And she was talking about educating um, Denver and just youth in the community about the importance of water and water stewardship. So I will also take this moment. I was gonna announce this at the end, but our partners at Olnaweg and Creative Destruction Lab have been working together to put together a small youth initiative where we will be collecting artwork from youth in the Atlantic region, which will be um, displayed on the Olnaweg website. So I will be including the consent form for the art submission in the follow-up comms. And I hope that people on this call will take the time to educate the youth in their lives about the importance of water stewardship and the water in their region. And if they're interested in creating a piece of artwork about how they relate to water or the water in your region, we would love to see it. More information on that to come. I will now invite Kelsey back to introduce our next speaker, Doreen. Thanks, Kara. Doreen Bernard is a Mi'kmaq grandmother of nine, a mother of four, a grassroots water protector, and a water walker and cultural teacher. She draws her strength and courage from the Indigenous women in her life, survivors of residential schools, elders, teachers, leaders, and movers and shakers. These women inspired her to work in social justice with the survivors of residential school on Mi'kmaq treaty rights, resisting environmental racism, awareness of murder, missing and murdered Indigenous women and relatives, and the protection of water. In 2017, Doreen was the Cody Chair in Social Justice at St. Effects's Cody International Institute. And in this role, she focused on educating Indigenous perspectives on Indian residential schools, Mi'kmaq treaty rights, environmental racism, and the protection of water and climate justice. We are so honored to have Doreen here to speak with us today. Thank you, Mike. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Mean Delawasi, Gesadam Dandali Olnaway. My spirit name is I Love My Indian Ways. And I'm from the Gilnet clan, the Otter clan, Sabaganagiri, uh, Mi'kma'ki. So I'm very honored to be able to speak for the water today. I'd like to uh, share a PowerPoint with you, some nice pictures, and get my face off the screen. <laughs> yes. So I would like to speak for the water 
And I first must acknowledge the Indigenous knowledge keepers, my teachers that I have learned from over the years for their love and commitment to share the teachings of our cultures, our medicines, the language, the connection to the land and water, and the responsibility to honor and protect it. I share the teachings as part of my lifelong journey of healing and learning from lived experience and ancestral memory of the historic trauma of colonization, experience of residential school, and the resilience of our continued resistance on environmental racism, oppression, and an infringement on Mi'kmaq treaty rights and human rights and the impacts on our families, our communities, our nation, which is all a part of the legacy that I want to pass down to the next generations. As a youth, I remember looking up to the women who were activists and worked to lift up our people and teach about our culture. It took a long time to trust and to embrace the teachings and to start practicing what I learned, but I always have always been an advocate for in Indigenous rights. On my healing journey through ceremonies, like, like the sweat lodge and the sun dance and fasting and connecting to women's teachings, healing ceremonies and the understanding of the sacredness of water, I became involved in the protection of the water and the water walks. This connection led to the witnessing of the actions of other grandmothers who were standing up and educating about the sacredness of water in their actions to walk for the water in prayer, educate the public about the pollution of mother earth and the water and about the responsibility to protect the water. Water is alive, water has spirit. It feels, it sees, it hears, it knows our intentions. Our grandmother, Josephine Mandeman, Mother Earth Water Walker, taught this through her example of humility and commitment and love and her teachings of the water. I learned my role as a woman water protector and embraced my shared responsibility to protect the water and all life that needs clean water to live. The water can heal you. You can heal the water with your prayers and intentions. Dr. Masaru Imoto taught us about this in his water crystal experiments. The indigenous people have always known and had understanding of their relationship with the water. Another water protector and mother earth defender who inspires me is David Suzuki. And I have met him a few times. I spoke about our protection of the water here in Mi'kmaq. The water protectors opened the Blue Dot 2016 in, in Halifax, and he continues to support the protection of Mother Earth and the water. The life, culture, and strength of the Indigenous people cannot be separated from the sacredness of water. We embrace our connection to the land and her lifeblood and encourage all people to remember that water is precious and every living being depends on it to live. Water must be defended at all costs. Water is life. Our women's teachings are that women have been given the sacred gift, the ability to carry new life in the womb, surrounded by water. We drink the water, we breathe the water, we are the water. We are over 75% water. When we are born, we come into this world through the water to take our first breath, carrying the spirit of the water inside of us. We are spiritual beings living a human experience. Women have also been given the responsibility to protect the water and Mother Earth for the life they bring into the world as well as the voice, be the voice for the water to ensure there will always be clean water to sustain all life 
and for future generations. Men have a role as well to protect the women and the children. Women have often been on the front lines to protect the water against industrial pollution and the destruction of the land. There is a direct correlation to industrial destruction of Mother Earth and the violence against Indigenous women around the world and the many missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls and relatives. Many have been murdered and have gone missing while standing on the front lines in front of industry and military and governments to defend the sacred. Many have died from violence and abuse from corporations that destroy the lands and water. Many men have also died while, while defending the women and children in their communities. Through media, we have witnessed these atrocities around the world caused by industry and governments that only see our mother in the waters as commodities. The resource extraction and the destruction of land and water and people, animals, fish, liars, all life that are collateral damage and inconvenience expendable to their wealth, quest for wealth and greed. Mi'kmaq women, grandmothers, acted to assert our treaty rights to fish and claim our land and our water in the Shubanagini River in 2015. Several of our grandmothers are in the court system for trespass on our own lands while we are protecting the water from corporate pollution. Young men and young women have come to the front lines to stand for the water. Our people stand up for our treaty rights, Mi'kmaq treaty rights being violated and we are criminalized and, and systemic racism is allowed by the government and the police against us. Mi'kmaq women have also been in danger and are fighting for the rights to fish in our own territory, asserting our treaty rights and title to our unceded Mi'kmaq. Recently, the UN, UN, UN Committee on Environmental Racism and Discrimination Committee have interve inter intervened on behalf of Mi'kmaq, asking Canada to respect treaty rights and protect the Mi'kmaq. We are also, we are at, excuse me, just going through my notes here. Throughout the world, water is being impacted by mankind's thirst for money and power throughout the development and extraction and pollution. The women are witness to the violence and destruction of Mother Earth and the water around the world through the attacks, rapes, and the number of missing and murdered Indigenous women. Grandmother Moon is also witness to the destruction of the water as she influences the oceans and waters on the surface, underground, from above, and from within each of us. All life that depends on clean waters to live. At this time, the grassroots grandmother, grassroots women must be uplifted and be given a seat at the tables of leadership where decisions are being made to speak for the water and teach about the sacredness of water and what is needed to protect the water for all life and future generations. Now, women are stakeholders, protecting and taking care of the water, the food and the medicines to care for their children and family, their community. They use the water to clean, to wash, to grow, to harvest, to cook, to feed all, and to have a sacred relationship with the water as life givers and a responsibility to speak for the water. The world powers are out of balance and women need to take their place as leaders and stakeholders in decisions on the protection of water, our oceans and our waters that are 
for drinking water that are needed to support life on Mother Earth to ensure the survival now and in the future. I'm sorry, I'm a little slow here. We are at the crossroads where every human being is called to solidarity with peoples across Turtle Island where water and lands are at risk due to environmental racism, industrial contamination, fossil fuel energy infrastructure, climate change, state laws and vigilante violence that puts lives at risk. This has, this has happened in the past, in the present and will happen in the future if we do not all stand together to demand change. We call on everyone to come up, stand up, show up, take action for what is right and just for the health of our environment and all life that depends on the land and the water to survive. The climate crisis is not just an indigenous issue. It is a human issue caused by human indifference on our independence, interdependence, for all living beings to survive on Mother Earth. There are many things you can do for the water that you can do to become involved. When we stood up for environmental racism, we stood together. We stopped. Indigenous and non-Indigenous people came together to stop fracking in Unamaji in 2012. People came together to close Boat Harbor, to finally stop the poisoning of their water. And they are still standing by for the cleanup of ASEG. We are over 55 years of sand and gravel mining on top of the aquifer in our backyard in Indian Brook. And the sand and gravel mining um, has the least, expand at least to continue for a hundred years. We want to stop the mining of uh, the, the sand that makes up, protects the aquifer. There are many ways that you can become involved, raise awareness of the need for environmental justice and clean water for all life. Participate in the Mi'kma'ki water walks and the water walks where you are either as a support, as, educate, as education, to walk and pray for the water, to honor the water where you live, that you rely on. Celebrate and stand up to protect your own watershed and source of clean water. Get to know where your water comes from and deepen your relationship with the water. Love the water, thank the water, respect the water. Remember across, Remember across Turtle Island, many people do not have clean drinking water. All across Canada, people, the water is at risk to oil and gas and industrial contamination or has been already contaminated where people, especially indigenous people, do not have clean water to drink. We ask the Mi'kmaq and non-Indigenous communities in the Shubanagiri River watershed continue to oppose fossil fuel industry infrastructure where Alton Gas proposes to mine salt to create 18 massive underground national natural gas caverns to store gas for export. We are also in oppose, we also oppose the Goldboro LNG export terminal project. We call that the belly of the snake um, in Alton Gas. And the head of the snake is the terminal in Goldboro, where we and we do not consent to the 5,000 man camp construction or the Mi'kmaq involvement of providing hospitality services to this camp. We know that the missing and murdered Indigenous women's report high statistics of missing and murdered women in relation 
to the energy and extractive industries in Canada and the USA, where these man camps are located. This fossil fuel industry is dependent on frack gas and will open Mi'kma'ki to fracking and more destruction to the water in the future. Educate yourself about this fossil fuel project and the impacts it will have on communities, our environment and climate change. Across Canada, support the call for action on clean drinking water for Indigenous communities, some who have been waiting for over 20 years. Find a way to support their basic human rights to clean water, clean land and resources to survive. Think about the legacy we are leaving behind and what we want to leave behind for the next future generations. When we walked the water 850 kilometers in 2019 from, from the Alton Gas site at the Treaty Truck House in Mi'kmaq to, to, throughout Mi'kmaq and Willowstook Territory, Penobscot and Passamaquoddy Territory, what called the Wabanaki Water Walk. We met many people that were standing up and met um, people, water, I would say water protectors from all walks of life that were um, aw awoken, you know, to the spirit of the water. And it was very beautiful to, uh, to receive this artwork from the children of the, the Willowstook um, School in, in um, what was the name of that the place there? It was just beautiful. And they, they, uh, their teacher came to meet us on the highway when we were walking through St. John and she brought uh, their artwork and donations and, and uh, a basket of fruit the children presented to us. It was uh, much needed inspiration to continue to walk in the heat of summer um, during that time. And I think uh, she sent me um, more artwork this year, although we didn't walk um, outside of uh, Nova Scotia this year um, in Mi'kma'ki because of the pandemic. But uh, they were, they wanted us to um, stop in there <laughs> if we were coming by this time. And uh, I hope to uh, visit schools in the future and um, talk about the sacredness of water and bring and, and walk with children in their, in their territories. And I think we're gonna wait until the, uh, the end to share this uh, water ceremony with you. And I thank you for listening to me. Wonderful, thank you so much, Doreen. Yes, we will come back to the water ceremony, but before we do that, I just want to give everyone an opportunity, if you haven't already, to get your glass of water for the water ceremony. I have mine right here, ready to go. And I would also love to open it up to our question, um, question and answer and discussion portion of the event. So if you do have a question for any of our speakers or um, if you just have a comment you'd like to share, I'd like to invite you to unmute yourself or if you don't feel comfortable doing that, please feel free to throw your questions in the chat. We do have people moderating the chat as well. If no one has a question right away, I will pose one to our speakers. And Barb, please feel free to throw any of your answers in the chat for us to see. Where did I have my questions? So Doreen, you had touched on this and Nicole, you touched on this as well, um, speaking about your daughter, daughters, sorry. Um, but what are some ways that we can approach talking about water or water advocacy 
to the youth in our lives. Just any tips or suggestions you have for anyone out there that wants to start these conversation um, with their own children or grandchildren and how they should go about doing that. You can feel free to just unmute yourself. Could you repeat that? Repeat that? <laughs> yeah, no worries. I was just saying for anyone that's interested in um, speaking about water advocacy to youth, um, their children or their grandchildren or anyone in their community, what are some first steps you might suggest so they can start those conversations? Well, I think it's um, it would be good to do the ceremony that we're going to share um just to start that 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 conversation about about the the water as a spirit as an entity as a living being and and um i think that would be a good place to start for talking about the water wonderful and just a reminder to everyone that we are recording this session so if you do want to access the recording later and do the water ceremony with um, anyone at home that you weren't able to be with today, you will have the opportunity to do that. I just also wanted to say that Barb put in the chat that educating early, so there's nothing sadder than seeing garbage along our water systems. Mm -hmm. And I agree there's really, um, really no age, I think that you need to start talking about this, the earlier, the better, and just creating that awareness. And kids are like sponges, right? Especially when they're young. So yeah, start these conversations early for sure. Doreen, Arlene in the chat is also wondering if you have any advice on starting a water walk. Yes, I, I, um, I have. There was a young woman at um, Tara. Lewis, who joined us on the water walk here in Mi'kmaq um, during the COVID, you know, we didn't have a lot of people walking with us, but she came down and walked with us. And do you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And um, so I, I presented her with the a pail that I had, a copper pail that I had um, because I had gotten um, one given to me and I bought one. And I wanted to her to start the next water walk in um, in uh, Unamage. So she's going to start. Uh, she's going to be planning a water walk in Unamage for I don't know when. It was. It's up to her and her community to uh, to get together and decide when that will be, and if it's going to be next year or if it's going to be this sometime this year. But um, yes, and I'm, I've, I've been praying for that, that re women would reach out. So the plan was before COVID happened that we would travel to other communities. Um, a couple of years ago in 2017, um, women came from Elsie uh, Bukduk and walked with us on the water walk here in Mi'kmaq uh, along the Shibi River. And um, I, I I loaned them the um, pail to go home and start a walk in their community for the for the river, um, and that and that's uh, that's how things have happened. So I went I went up there to you know support their walk, and that's what we plan to do. Anybody that needs uh, that support, you know, to to do the the pipe ceremonies to start the ceremony to, to end the ceremony you know, and in between whatever they need to uh, support and help them to plan ahead. And we've done enough now that we know, kind of uh, have an idea of what we're going to need and, and um, yeah, reaching out to people. So yes, uh, just reach out to me and I'm sure I, I'll get back to you and, and help you in any way. Yeah. Our next walk will be, um, next May um, and I'm hoping that other there will be walks in other places once the COVID you know restrictions are all lifted and we're able to uh, to to travel freely and and go places that we need to go do what we need to do. Yeah. 
<laughs> we have another question in the chat here. Um, do we yeah. still have some time, Karen? Yeah, we have a couple minutes and then we will go into our water ceremony. Okay, mm -hmm. the, the next question is how can immigrant and newcomer communities connect with indigenous cultures and teachings around the protection of water and creation? Mm -hmm. Oh, say it again, sorry. No, that's okay. Um, so this next question is around how can immigrant and newcomer communities connect with indigenous cultures and teachings on the protection of water? Hmm. Well, there have been lots of uh, people reach out and um, do talks in their community on the protection of water. Um, I've been involved in several universities and another one coming up. Uh, the end of the month um, at, at the, the Mount um, to talk about, the, you know, the uh, protection of water and our role as women to protect the water and being, being uh, a uh, water protector. Um, so joining into those talks that are available, you know, online, as well as, uh, I mean, there was times when we would go to the river at the Treaty Truck House of people who could come down and we would um, do, you know, do a talk there as well, you know, about the, about the, um, our, our responsibility as women to protect the water. And, and um, lots of times they came up with ways of how they could support, you know, the protection of water, either planning uh, talks in the city, you know, amongst uh, their, their peers, um, groups, um, also fundraising, you know, for the women that are, that are going to these events to, uh, and for supplies at the, at the Chitty Truck House, different things that they've, they've done, but, um, and even per participating, some, you know, participated on water walks by, by coming out, not being able to walk the whole walk, you know, several days in a row, but coming out to walk during that time or a day or a few hours or an afternoon or whatever they could they could do. And they learn a lot that way as well. Thank you for sharing, Doreen. Um, and thank you for everyone that asked questions. We will be providing a lot of resources and also links so you can connect with our speakers and their organizations following this event if you do have any other questions. And I would like to thank our event partners who are amazing and they are the reason that today happened. Creative Destruction Lab Atlantic, Dalhousie University, Women in Business New Brunswick, Olnawag and Olnawag Foundation. Um, couldn't have done this without you guys. And thank you so much to our speakers, Doreen, Nicole and Barb. Uh, I had such a great time getting to know each and every one of you and hope that we continue to stay connected as we move forward in our advocacy. But I will pass off the mic to Doreen to end this on a great note. And I would just love to thank everyone for being here today, miigwech. Okay. Yes, I wanna thank everybody for um, being here today and being a part of this. Uh, I think um, we don't realize how much uh, we, we need water that we have water until you don't have it. <laughs> and um, we just take for granted that it's always going to be there. And um, our, our teaching is that we shouldn't do that. We should never take the water for granted. You know, water is alive. It has spirit. And it is, our, our life depends on clean water. And the oceans and all the water that we can't drink supports life that we also depend on. It, it, it has so much impact on Mother Earth, on the climate, on all the, um, the, um, yeah, the things that affect us, um, the grow our, our seasons, you know, our, the climate that um, is, guided by the oceans so we 
we we have to um, make that relationship with water. So this ceremony is a simple ceremony. And I just take a glass of water. We ask you to put the water. So you're already putting your intention in the water for the water when you place this water next to you when you go to sleep. So the water knows you, it feels you, it sees you, it hears you. It knows your your dreams, it knows your thoughts, you know, it hears you. Grandmother Josephine taught that one time she sat by the water and it was dead, it wasn't moving, it was polluted water and she prayed and put her tobacco in the water. And she said, and the water started moving. And she said, it, it heard her intentions, it heard her prayer. She said, you can heal the water with your prayer. So when you pick up your water in the morning, you take that tobacco. We use tobacco, but I was taught you can also use cornmeal. When you go out and you place that tobacco on Mother Earth to say, to thank, to thank you, thank, give thanks for the water. And you tell the water, I love you. I thank you. I respect you. Water is life. And have that relationship. It's like that's connecting the water that's inside of you. By the time you're our age, you are 60% water. When you were born, you were 75% water. And uh, so you, you connect that water that's inside of you with the water in this cup that represents the water everywhere, the water that comes down from the sky, the water that's below the, the earth, the water that flows on the earth. All the waters in the world, these tears that come down, these sacred tears of water, they're sacred. And you, I sing to the water, we tell people to say this, uh, tell the water in any language, you know. This this teaching came from uh, Anishinaabe grandmother, Doreen Day, who uh, they used to sing this song when they were driving her, her, when she was driving her grandson to school, sing it as a lullaby. And then, and then she drove him to school to drop him off and they would sing this song and they would go by water and and she would sing this, they would sing the song. And one day he, he was old enough to say, you know, Grant Mushum, uh, Nugumi, yeah, Nugumi, she says, you should, you should, we should write this down and share it with the world. She said, he said, because everybody on, on Mother Earth needs to know how to respect, love and respect and thank the water. So that's what they did during the water walk, Mother Earth water walk. She wrote it down and she put it out there. So we sing this song in in uh, Anishinaabe to uh, honor the grandmother who shared this song with the world. All it's saying, simple, I love you, someone. You sing it in Mi'kmaq. We, I sing it in uh, Anishinaabe to honor the, the gift for the song and also sing it in Mi'kmaq. So I'll sing the song and um, you just uh, think about what you are asking this water. So put your prayer into the, your water. You say, I tell the water, oh, Gisel, thank you for this water. Water, I ask you for your medicine. Be my medicine today. Go to my mind, my heart, my body, my spirit, my emotions, where I need that healing and that hope to carry me through this day. So you can bless your own water. So I'll sing the song. You can think about what I what I said to, to put your intention, ask in this water to be your medicine. Nebe Kisageiko Chimikwe Chuwe Nemiko 
que se ahoga en ti mi ser. And we sing it four times. And then we sing in the midnight. I'll sing it once and then sing it again. Dando a water it says and then we drink our water and we start our day and you can teach this to your children your family you know your friends you can teach this the ceremony and practice it every day have relationship with the water thank you allow i'm sitting over my Thank you for that, Doreen. That was a wonderful way for us to end off our session today. Um, so I won't take up anyone's, any more time from anyone. So I just want to thank everyone for being here. And we will be sending out some follow-up communications following yes. the event. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I wish I could have talked to you guys. Oh. I know, me too. Thank you so much for being here though, Barb. It was great to see your lovely face, even if we couldn't hear you. And I loved reading your comments in the chat box, so. Yeah, really interesting additions in the chat. So I'm just going to stop our recording.